My name is Ian Walsh, and this is Masters of the Market. Um, joined with equity retail brokers Ken Yanni. Ken, thanks for being on, and Ed Ginn, thank you very much for your time, both of you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks. So as everybody's been following, most likely all week, you guys have learned that you you guys are, are very large in your space, the retail commercial world. We have some commu uh, people in common we know. You guys did over $80 million in sales last year. You're massive in the region. You deal with huge players like Starbucks, Wawa, everywhere that everybody, every company that everybody knows um, around here in their local retail space. You go to your Wawa, you get your cup of coffee, go to your yoga class, and then go to Target, right? You, somewhere I'm stopping at one of your places that you guys have probably touched. Yeah. So I'm not going to yoga, though. Um, so guys, what I wanted to talk about today was um, a Masters of the Market, and I really find this relevant to what people are listening to here. And the reason we kind of set out to do this, which I said, I mentioned to you guys off the show, was to determine where the market is going, because as a lender, it's really important to me. I have to time that just right. Because if I'm in a transactional um, situation, you sell, a, you sell a property, you're no longer in it. You don't have a tie to it. But at any given time, I'm tied up for 12 months on a deal. And it doesn't take 12 months for the market to crash. It takes less. So I've got to feel when I'm at near the top, when I'm near the bottom. I've got to hedge my bets accordingly. It's all relevant. So I took basically a consensus across as many big players in the industry as I could find. And you guys are definitely one of them. Now, you guys come from a different space being in the retail world. So it gives a totally different perspective, um, which I'm very interested in. And as we had spoken earlier, um, Ed, you, you've been through three cycles now, right? Three, four cycles. Yeah. Well, so I, pleasant reminder. Is that, is that well, pleasant reminder? Well, the first um, house that I bought with my wife was a triplex in Ocean City, New Jersey, and the interest rate was sixteen and three quarters. Eighties, nineteen eighties, nineteen eighties. It probably would have been eighty-one or so, and I had to put. I thought I was, you know, spending a fortune. I put thirty thousand dollars down on a nine ninety thousand dollar property, but it was sixteen and three quarters. Crazy man. Hopefully you refi and, and, and it paid off at some point. We refied and then sold. Gotcha. Yeah, I was gonna say your money. That money out in the eighties. I don't. Know, I don't know what my business would have done in the eighties because my money would have been cheaper than money on the streets, which is crazy. Fed money, but different time. You survived it. You've done well with it. You flourished. So I'd like to know what. What. What about two thousand eight? How did that affect your industry? The two thousand eight, two thousand nine craziness. Um. It was um, it was it was a difficult period of time, you know, because everything sort of came to a halt. Um, tenants pulled back. We have a big tenant representation division, and everybody slowed down. I I, I still know a property on City Line Avenue, 2008. I had it under agreement. The world starts crashing. My buyer says, "Hey, I'm out," and you know, with five days left in due diligence, so he was out. He regrets not buying the property today because it adjoined one of his other properties, but. Um, we were fortunate that you know we were able to backfill another buyer, but you know uh, it wasn't that wasn't a deal that I was involved with in the office. Someone else in the office did that deal. So, uh, well, you, you so everybody felt. I mean, something happened at that moment. Everybody felt it one way or the another. But what did you see leading up to that in your industry that you said? Something doesn't smell right here. Like it's. I mean, we obviously knew when people were giving mortgages to dogs, it didn't make sense, right? But what were some of the some of the writing on the wall in your space that really like was throwing up some red flags maybe not exactly the day it crashed but coming into the crash you kind of saw some stuff i'm sure well i think what you say generally is developers getting into the business that aren't seasoned developers so i think that hurts the retail end of the business a little bit but the one thing retail has always been pretty good and controlled by the banks and the financial institutions they didn't we didn't get hit as hard as some of the other um, sectors of the economy which is more speculative because if someone's developing for a CDS or they're developing for a Wawa they, they've got good credit behind their project right mm -hmm. the other I think the other sectors really get hurt hard if you're building you know 60 unit apartment building and the market goes south and people are moving in with their parents I think you're going to get really hit but generally if you have a firm lease you've got the credit of these national tenants behind you and you're going to get paid. Got yes. To that point where a lot of apartment buildings are being built on spec and without any leases signed, developers aren't even touching this land until a full lease is executed with a, one of these corporate giants like a CDS or a Wawa. So the risk is minimal at that point. So interesting you say that, um, and I don't mean to scare anybody watching this, but that spec builder thing that you were just talking about is 
absolutely dominant in this market right now. Um, there's a lot of it going on. I'm not saying it means tomorrow the world's ending. I'm just saying what you did, what you witnessed in 2008. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but there's a lot of that spec building going on um, as we speak. So the question is, at least in the Philadelphia market, can it sustain? You know, I always say that if you're in a bubble, you're it has to be supported by infrastructure in order to not be a bubble. Otherwise, you're being supported by thin air, and then it is a bubble. So like. Do we have enough, you know, is Amazon going to come in and, and save the day and put 50,000 jobs in the area? And then therefore the speculative guys that are building right now, they can support, there's, there's the homes will support the infrastructure. But if you just are building to build and people aren't moving in, you now put yourself in a bubble. So at least that stuff's on the wall. I don't ever think we'll, well, no, I don't want to say that. I don't believe the reason that we'll crash again is going to be the same reason it was last time. I just don't, it was two things in our industry that compounded or multiple things, it'll be something else and it'll happen again. But the signs always tend to be the same, right? I, uh, one of the, there's a post that one time I had some uh, professor from Harvard had this amazing post about a graph. It's just like a simple showing of how a cycle works in real estate. And it was just, you know, supply and demand and, and, and so forth. And when the cranes go up, the buying should stop, right? Like it is what it is. So I feel right now, and maybe, you know, I don't know what your industry seems. I know people ask me, I just got asked this question last night, you know, when should I sell? And I was like, I don't know. Nobody knows the top. I don't care who you are. You don't know the top. You don't know that moment until it happens. But um, I can say we're closer to the top of a cycle than we are the bottom of a cycle. And as you had mentioned, uh, your guy in City Line wish he was in the deal still now because everything's come back up and we're, we're somewhere near the top of a cycle. What do you guys see in your space right now? What is the taste and the, and the, uh, and the appetite of the, your industry compared to maybe where it was a few years ago? And what do you think is coming uh, over the next five years? So I think we have, this is my opinion, I think we saw the top about a year ago in the single tenant net lease space. So at that time you were seeing cap rates at the, I think the all time lows and they were moving. If things were sitting on the market. If Starbucks for instance was going out at a Four and a half, the half, the 4.75 cap, and there was a buy within two weeks. Now you're seeing them, they're going out at a little bit higher cap rate, so the prices are going down a little bit, and they're sitting for longer. Things are still moving, but not at the rate that they were maybe 12 to 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's, uh, we're seeing the exact same thing in the high-end residential space to where we are, exact same, like, to the T. Um, okay. So how do you adjust your business model? How does the commercial retail brokerage adjust its business model for potentially what's to come or do you not or is it just because it's transactional you just adjust your numbers your buyers are always there because they're so big I don't know uh, I think right now we're not really changing the business model it's just more the pricing of assets and maybe a little bit on different ways that we're marketing marketing the properties and who we're marketing them to but for the most part the 1031 market is still driving what we're doing so not much has changed prices have went down slightly but not enough that is really affecting the buyers and sellers. And in, in the triple net business, it really doesn't, the degradation in pricing doesn't change dramatically because it goes from four and a half to 4.75. And that's tough, you know, if you're the developer, because the developers take tremendous risk. Everybody looks at them as their bungees are making a fortune. And um, there are some of the most creative guys in the world and girls in the world that are in that business. I mean, they. They take huge risks. They take huge risks of their time and their money. Uh, so, you know, I'm not diminishing the pain that comes from an asset that gets priced from five to five and a quarter, but um, it doesn't go from five to seven, right? And if you're in the residential space and a property, you know, goes or a multi tenant retail property and you, you thought you could sell it at five and a half and then it goes to seven. That's a big swing. That's right. Generally, in the triple net, we're not seeing those big swings. We're seeing 25 basis points to 50 basis point swings. So you guys here in a space, so uh, it's just more gradual, which is not bad. gradual in either direction, probably. So the crash is more gradual, the upswing is more gradual. Which, you know, I'm a lender, so I like I like low risk, right? So, and you're right, developers, man, whew, like that is it, it, like. Yeah, they make a fortune and they risk everything. I mean, it's there's for every one developer that makes it, there's ten that don't. And um, I don't know about your space in the commercial space and the residential space for sure. You know, everybody. It, it, I guess there's some mystique to it. There's some air of you know it looks sexy to do that in this business, but man, you got to check your stomach and understand if you have the appetite to do that kind of stuff. That's not for everybody. It's not for me. It's my lens. It's not for well, me. 
the record in our office, I think, from bringing a tenant to a site in our tenant representation group to our firm getting paid is 13 years. From the time our tenant rep group brought the proper, the tenant to a site and they said, yes, we want to be there, to the time it got approved, to the time that the check came in to the developer so that he could write us a check. And we're, we're at the hip. We're right on, you know, on the side of the developer. They, you know, we play for four cents on the dollar. They're paying for 96 cents, but we're connected. And that was 13 years for us of pain. And to the developer, it's huge pain. So you're telling me that nobody's getting a check, quote unquote, check for 13 years from the start of ground to so when that's that the longest one we've had. I have one. My record is six and a half years. Brought the tenant to a piece of real estate, was able to get the deal done, but it took six and a half years. So you guys are telling me that if I wanted to get into your business, this is why people don't get into your business, because most people aren't going to sit there and say, hey, you might get paid in five years. Literally is what you're telling me, right? If you work on dirt. I think that, yeah, ground up development from the brokerage side definitely takes longer. By the time you find the tenant, find the space, everything gets approved and built, leases are executed, and rent commences. But from what we're doing in the investor sales side, it's not nearly yeah. as long as that. Gotcha. Okay. Just for the uh, risk that the developer has, because we're if we were working on that deal that takes six or 13 years, we're risking our time. And I'm doing that deal, but the developers are putting money out of their pocket for engineering, approvals, zoning, every, all types of different expenses. We're only putting our time out. So that's crazy, though. I, I would never, I wouldn't even consider that. You know, my average, my average deal closes in five days. I just, you know, that's. Uh, but you guys probably make a whole lot more in one transaction than I do. So um, I get it. That's just that's just uh, the tolerance level for the cash flow. But so guys, I really appreciate your time. I have learned a good bit here. Hopefully everybody watching has learned. Do you guys have anything you want to leave everybody with or any information you feel is relevant to people watching this? Um, not really. Just if you have any questions or would like to speak further, have a project you're looking at, uh, feel free to give either one of us a call. Uh, you can reach me at 484-417-2223 or you can reach Ed at 484-417-2201. And I would just leave you, you know, the single tenant triple nets, they are great assets because you, you, know, you can usually sleep at night. Okay, I like it. So, as everybody watching, you probably know me, Ian, at hardmoneybankers.com. Um, you guys know where to find us, and uh, this is a good episode. I like getting information at places that I have not, I don't understand, and I didn't understand your world, and I understand a lot better now. So, thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. Thank Thanks. you.